We are going to talk about section 7.4. It's entitled The Mean. But there's really two concepts we're going to learn today. One, well, okay. The mean is, is, is obviously something you know about, but we're going, to, we're going to also think of the mean as something called the expected value, which might be a new way to think about things and is actually quite useful concept for probability, especially in terms of making decisions when there's uncertainty around. Okay, technical, technical terms here, technical definition for, by the, by the word population, we mean all of a category. And by the word sample, we mean a subset of the population used to analyze a population, right? Okay, so all of the people who vote in an election would be a population, and we get an exact idea of what they vote for, but of course people are interested to know beforehand and to triangulate and make decisions in order to favor, in order to be favored in the voting, and so they take samples of voters to try to figure out something about the whole population from the sample, right? Because it's impossible to test everybody, and so you just test some number. Okay, so the sample mean is a very simple definition, which I'm sure you might guess even if, if, if you were forced to. So the average value of numbers in a sample is called the sample mean. So, if the sample is x1 all the way to xn, then the sample mean is often called x bar, and it's x1 plus x2 all the way to xn, divided by however many there are, n of them. Right, so that's what we mean by the sample mean. It's simply the, the arithmetic average of the numbers in the sample. So, for example, we had, an, we had a, an example of a car dealership. So we had weekly sales and number of weeks. And I'll just write this chart again. If you don't want to write it, that's fine because it's, it's in your notes earlier and in the textbook. Okay, so we had 52 total weeks. Two weeks we sold five cars, two weeks we sold six, 13 weeks we sold seven, so on and so forth. And we want to find what is the sample mean? This means the average weekly sales in this case. To find that, it's a little bit of a calculation. Um, there are two weeks in which we sell five cars, so we want two fives added into our number, so that's five plus five. There's two weeks where we sell six cars, so six plus six. There are 13 weeks where we sell seven, so that's 13 sevens added up. There are 20 weeks where we sell eight, so 28s are added up, 10 weeks where we sell 9, so 10 9s added, uh, 4 weeks where we sell 10, and finally 1 week where we sell 11. And that's, we're taking all of the things, all of the samples, adding them up and dividing by however many there are, and there are 52, and we're going to get a number about 7.96. Okay. So they have average weekly sales of about eight automobiles. So that's the idea behind the sample mean. There's another type of mean called the population mean. If the quantity is known for the whole population,
say x1 to xn with this capital n is is meant to be like bigger than this the little n which is the sample right this is just then the population mean is called mu greek letter mu and it's just the arithmetic mean of the different things here so it's x1 plus x2 all the way to x capital n and we divide by capital n so in practice x bar is used to estimate mu okay. it seems strange that we have two different words here one x bar always stands for a sample mean and mu stands for a population mean why are we picky about those two well in this course it's not going to matter very much okay but in 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 honest statistical study we want to make sure that we know the difference between the reality and a sample that we might take for the reality and so in when you're doing statistical calculations trying to to, to demonstrate statistical theories it's important to keep these two things separate okay? but for us it probably seems a little bit fussy and strange but this is just this is a reality involved with statistics okay now there's other ways to take means sometimes we can calculate means with relative frequency and I'll show how we might do that okay this is this is a different way to take a mean it is entirely the same mathematically the difference is instead of dividing by n after we add everything up we're going to divide by n before we add everything up and by that we mean the relative frequency and let me show you an example i'm going to write out a big table of data and, and i'll show what i mean by that so the example is going to be a study of life expectancy of deer so we have age at death and we have number of deer So we'll have numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And number of deer, 0 are observed to be dead at age 1, 60 at age 2, 180, 250, 200, 120, 50, 120, 20. Okay, so those are the raw numbers, right? There are 60 deer that die at age 2, 180 deer that die in the third year of age, and so on and so forth. Right? So we could find the mean age of death. What we're trying to do is find the sample mean age of death for a deer. Right? Looking at this chart, it looks like the answer is probably going to be somewhere between 4 and 5. Right? Just, just looking at it, we could kind of eyeball that. But if we want to calculate the sample mean, we have two choices. We can take... 60 times 2, 180 times 3, 250 times 4, and so on and so forth. Or we can first compute the relative frequencies. And this is going to be a number between 0 and 1. What we're going to do here is if we add up the total number of deer in this sample here, let's add this up, we get a 0 here, 14, 19, 21, 26, 28, 30, so 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, there's exactly a thousand deer in this sample. So what I'm going to do is to get from this table, this, this column in the table, to the next column, I'm dividing each of these numbers by 1,000. That's how I get this next column of relative frequency. So we get 0. 0 0.06, 0 0.18, 0 0.25, 0 0.20, 0 0.05, 0 0.12, 0 0.02. And if we add up all these numbers, we would get exactly one. 
Okay. So I've divided by n already, right? n is 1,000 for this sample. I've already divided by n, so I'm not going to divide by n anymore. But how do I figure out what my mean is? Well, the sample mean is going to be equal to age 1 times frequency of age 1 plus age 2 times frequency of age 2 plus age 3 times frequency of age 3 age 4 times frequency of age 4 5 times frequency of 5 6 times the frequency of 6 7 times the frequency of 7 8 times the frequency of 8 and 9 times the frequency of 9. Okay. So I'm taking each age and multiplying by the relative frequency. I, all I'm doing is computing the mean in a slightly different order. And what we get here is 4.87. So if you have raw data, you can use the first way of finding the mean. If your data is given to you in terms of probabilities, like if we're given the probability distribution, these relative frequencies here, it's a lot quicker to use this method to make the mean than it is the other method. Okay? So there's just there's two methods depending on how your data is given to you. If your data is given to you in raw numbers, you can do like we did before. If your data is given in terms of a probability distribution, relative frequencies, we can use this method. They're equivalent. They're mathematically the same thing. There's just one, one, for, uh, one for one circumstance, one for the other circumstance. Okay, so now we're going to talk about expected value, which is another ki kind of mean. Expected value is the same thing as the mean of a random variable. Okay, so we have possible outcomes for a random variable, and then we have the probability that that random variable is equal to that possible outcome. Okay, that's the chart we've seen with random variables. So this random variable could be counting number of successes for some number of trials. It could be, uh, you know, counting uh, the position of something at a certain time, all sorts of different things. But there's a number of outcomes that are possible, say k1, k2, all the way to say the nth possible, the last possible outcome. And then we have a probability associated to each of those. And of course the sum of these numbers is 1, the sum of the probabilities is 1, because all, everything's been accounted for. So now to find the expected value of x, we denote that e of x, and e around x is how we say the expected value of a random variable, and we take each outcome and multiply it by its probability. So it's very similar to what we just did with the uh, relative frequencies. Okay, okay so we're going to do a few examples. One really n nice one of expected value. But I'm going to start with a game of chance. Okay, in a carnival game, players select balls one at a time from an urn 
with two red and four white balls. They draw until a red ball is found. And they win 50 cents for each white ball chosen. They pay one dollar to play. We want to find the expected winnings. Okay, so I'll give you a second to finish writing here. So we're going to examine what are the expected winnings from this game. Okay, so I'm going to let X be equal to money won or lost. Okay, it'll be negative if money is lost. Right? And I'm going to make one of these tree diagrams to figure out what X's value is. So we take a ball, and if the first ball we choose is a red ball, then we are out $1. So negative $1 is the outcome if we pick a red ball first. The probability of that happening is one third because there are two red balls and four white balls. But the more hopeful outcome with probability two thirds is that we choose a white ball. And then we keep playing the game. Now, if the next ball we pick is red, we are done and we lose 50 cents. Right, because we get 50 cents back, but we paid 50 cents to play the we paid a dollar to play the game. So we're out 50 cents. And that's going to happen. Well, what's the probability that we pick a red ball? Well, there's now not there's not six balls anymore. There's five balls left. And two of them are red. So that's two fifths. But then alternatively, we could pick a white ball, and that's probability three fifths. Okay, then we pick another ball. Red, in this instance, is now possibility two over four because there are only four balls left and two of, two of them are red and two of them are white. In that case, we have won a dollar back, so that's a net winnings of zero dollars. And in that instance, we don't really get anything. However, if we get the white ball again, with probability two-fourths, then we keep playing. Okay, now there are only three balls left and two of them are red. So if we pick a red ball here, then we've picked three white balls total, so that's a 50 cent winnings. But otherwise, if we pick the white ball, which is only probability one-third now, that's, that's where we'd be at there. Then we take another ball, Probability one half, it's red because there's, no. We've picked all of the white balls now, right? There's only four white balls to pick from. All of them are out, so now this is probability one. We'd get a red ball. And now we've picked four white balls total, so we'd win $2, but we paid a dollar to play the game, so our winning is a dollar. Okay? So that details all the possible things that could be going on here. Okay. And so now we want to write it we want to figure out what is the probability that the random variable is equal to various numbers. So the probability that the random variable is equal to minus one, minus one dollar, is one third. Right? Because we can see exactly that one third outcome. Right? This let's highlight this. This is found here. Now, another possible outcome is not losing a full dollar, but losing 50 cents. That's like the random variable equals negative five. 
That is found in the tree diagram with this thing here, and that has probability two-thirds times two-fifths. And that is equal to 16, well, four-fifths, I guess, for now. Okay. And then we continue in this fashion. The probability that x equals 0, that is going to be 2 thirds times 3 fifths times 2 fourths. Oh, this, this, sorry, the last one is not 4 fifths, but 4 fifteenths. Okay, these numbers give us 12 over 60. The probability that x is equal to uh, 50 cents is going to be 2 thirds times 3 fifths times 2 fourths times 2 thirds and that is equal to 8 over 60 and lastly the probability that x is equal to 1 that we win a dollar is going to be 2 thirds times 3 fifths times 2 fourths times 1 third and that is equal to 4 over 60. And I'm going to write all these as parts of 60 with the common denominator. So we can see that 20 plus 16 plus 12 plus 8 plus 4 is 60. We have all the possibilities accounted for here. Okay, That's something you can do when you do a tree diagram to make sure that you've gotten it right, is make sure all those numbers add up to be 1. Okay, so now we find the expected value of this random variable by taking each outcome and multiplying by its probability. Negative 50 cents and multiply that by its probability, 16 over 60. Uh, Zero dollars, multiply that by its probability, 12 over 60. 50 cents, multiply by it by its probability, 8 over 60, and a dollar, multiply that by its probability, 4 over 60. When we add all these things up, we get minus one-third, which is negative 0.333, of course, repeating. Okay. So the expected winnings is negative 33 cents. So, you can't win 33 cents playing this game, right? It's impossible to win 33 cents playing this game. But that is the amount, or you can't, you can't lose exactly 33 cents, right? You either lose a dollar, 50 cents, you lose nothing, gain 50 cents, or gain a dollar. But what you should expect to get from it is negative 33 cents. So you wouldn't want to play this game habitually. Right? Because each time you play, you expect to lose 33 cents, and you'd probably go broke after a while playing this game if you continue to play it, because it has a negative expected value. Okay. Of course, the carnival wants you to continue playing this game. Right? Questions about this example of calculating expected value? We have a value times a probability. A value times a probability. We add it up. Okay, let's look at another game of chance. This is a famous example. Okay, suppose a game is played where a coin is tossed until heads is achieved. And the winnings double with each tail. Okay, so on the first flip, if, if, we, if we get exactly heads and then stop, the winnings are or outcome and winnings, we get nothing. 
if heads is the first thing to come up, okay? But if we get a tails and then a heads, we win a dollar. All right, we keep flipping the coin until we get heads. So another outcome is tails, tails, heads. There we get $2 because I said the winnings double each time. Then tails, 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 heads. We will get $4 in that outcome if you get three tails before heads. Uh, tails, 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 heads. That would be $8 and etc. right? There's no end to this game possibly, right? Like we could get, we could get tails forever. Okay, so this is a random variable that has actually has infinitely many outcomes. But let's try to figure out, even though, even though we're not going to be able to, to actually calculate here, we don't know how to add infinitely many numbers together. Let's think about what is possible here. So we could ask, what is the expected winnings? Okay, so what we'd have to do is figure out the probability of each of these outcomes. The first outcome has probability one half. The second outcome has probability one quarter. The third outcome has probability one eighth. The fourth, one sixteenth. The fifth, one thirty second, and so on and so forth. Right? And then these probabilities, a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth, they're getting closer and closer to one in the whole thing. Okay, so the expected value is, okay, with probability one-half, we win nothing. With probability one-quarter, we win a dollar. With probability one-eighth, we win two dollars. With probability one-sixteenth, we win four dollars. With probability... 132nd, we win $8. We add those up. This is zero plus a quarter plus a quarter. A qu of course, we're not done because there's so many outcomes. A quarter, quarter. Each time we calculate the expected winnings times the probability, we get one quarter. And if we keep adding up one quarter, 0 0.25 plus 2.25 and so on and so forth, Right? That never stops getting bigger. This is this would be infinity. So the average amount of money you would win by playing this game is infinity. What does that mean? Okay, well that means that if you find someone who is willing to play this game with you over and over and over again, and you are going to be on the, the, the side that collects when heads comes up. You should be willing to pay any amount of money to play this game over and over and over again. Because the expected winnings are infinite. Right? You will never find a casino offering this game because they would go broke. It doesn't seem likely that you're going to get tails, 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 heads, right? But you get eight dollars when it comes up. So this this is a this is a this is a probability paradox. I, I forget exactly what it's called, but this is this is a strange situation where the mean is infinity. We're not going to see these in the homework or anything like that. But I wanted to show you an example of a game which seems simple and fair, but for which no price could make this game fair at all to both sides. So this is really strange. Okay. Let me do a, a little bit more here. Um, so now we want to talk about expected value and binomial trials. Okay. So P is going to be the probability of success. And N is going to be the number of trials. It's not hard to guess, though, then the expectation, the expected value of x is going to be equal to the random variable, which, which is the numbers of success, is just n times p. 
Okay, so if you have a trial which has probability one half of going well and you do it a hundred times, you expect to get 50 successes. Now, obviously, you, you probably will not get 50 successes, but 50 is the number of successes you expect to get. And, of course, you should get a number near 50 in most outcomes. So, um, remember we talked about a, a, a box of washers, a box of 300 washers with a 2% defective rate. This means the expected number of defective washers in a box is 300 times 0.2%, which is six. We'd expect six bad washers in a box of 300. So for binomial trials, the mean is a very, very simple um, calculation. You just take the number of trials times the probability of success, and that gives you the mean. Okay, homework for today. Uh, numbers 10, 12, 18, 20, 22, 24, 30, and 34. Okay. And the book is up here. You need to take a look at that. And we've pretty much run out of time. So I will see you folks on Wednesday.